Okay, Laurent Picard is from Google. And yeah, let's take it away. Okay. So can you start your screen sharing? Yes. All done. So hello, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for having me today. Um, okay. I'm going to hide my own window. Okay. Uh, quick introduction. So my, my name is uh, Laurent Picard. As you can uh, you can tell, uh, I'm French. I'm actually based in Paris. And my background, um, I am an ebook pioneer. So I've been uh, working uh, in the ebook industry uh, for 17 years, 20 years ago. And for three years now, I'm focusing on cloud technologies uh, with Google Cloud. Okay. Unfortunately, I cannot uh, see you and ask you questions. Um, I, I very much like to, to start with uh, this quote from our uh, clock uh, because it really uh, shows the feeling I have whenever there's something new done with machine learning. And still after a couple of years, um, I feel magic, honestly. Uh, but this is just technology and, and you scratch a little bit, this is just technology and we can all understand uh, what's behind it or have a pretty uh, good idea. And my goal today is to maybe scratch a little bit behind uh, some stuff you haven't seen. My, I have my own definition of machine learning. Uh, that's a, a weird one, but uh, for me, uh, machine learning is solving solutions where you have data, right? You have data and you want to understand what's in your data. You want to extract information out of your data. So this is my personal definition, but it's a, an incorrect one. Uh, the real definition is that machine learning is a part of uh, AI and within machine learning, you have deep learning. So most of the stuff I'm going to show you uh, today is actually deep learning, but for simplicity, uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, I will be mentioning machine learning uh, most of the time. Uh, so how, how does uh, deep learning work? So first, uh, the expert uh, started to work on the field 40 years ago. Uh, last year, they actually got the, the, the Alan Turing Prize Award for that. Uh, it's like the, the Nobel Prize uh, for computer science. And they, they thought at the time, okay, uh, let's try to mimic the way we think our brain works with neural networks. For that, they needed uh, many examples and the magic here is that they managed to solve problems. And we don't know exactly why, or uh, we don't have the answer, uh, the systemic answer to solve these problems, but machine learning is now solving these problems where we couldn't solve them before. Why does it work today? Uh, so first of all, we are inheriting for, uh, century, uh, from centuries of science, and uh, in particular algorithms, a lot from coming from mathematics and, and uh, physics. Um, for a couple of decades, uh, we now have everything uh, we need for big data. We are able to store data. We are able to consult uh, a lot of data now thanks to computers. But, and for most now, for let's say a few years or one decade, now technology and especially cloud technologies uh, give us the computing power to do everything. Of course, uh, personal computers, laptops now have an, an amazing computing power, but uh, cloud technologies now allow you to go to the next step and do stuff in hours or days where it would take uh, weeks before. Okay, to give you an idea, so I'm, I'm going to, to talk uh, generally about uh, machine learning uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, but to give you an idea about how much important that is at Google, uh, so those are the numbers of projects. Um, so it's a couple of years back, uh, which have a machine learning problem, uh, sorry, a machine learning model in their projects. Um, and you've seen some of them uh, as results. So for instance, uh, in Gmail, when you start to type a sentence, you, can, you have a suggestion, suggestion to end the sentence. Uh, in Android, you, in the late version of Android, there is a local customized machine learning model learning from your habits and optimizing the battery life. And uh, in Google Photos, uh, maybe you've tried that. Um, if you say, okay, this is my kid on one picture, it will find a match of your kid on all other pictures. Uh, but even uh, 10 years back or two, uh, so it's, uh, it's very uh, amazing technology. 
there are three ways today uh, that, uh, that you can benefit from machine uh, learning. Of course, if you are an expert, then you know a lot about it. You're dealing with neural networks, and I hope you will learn a few or see a few things of interest for you, for you in this talk. But if you're spending most of your time de developing solutions, then maybe you don't have the expertise to deal with machine learning, but it doesn't matter. You can maybe use existing machine learning models. They are available through APIs. They are ready to use models. Right? And in between now, for a couple, since a couple of years, there, there are auto ML te techniques. Uh, so it's filling a big gap. You still don't need expertise, but you can automatically build custom customized models for your own needs. And the purpose of this talk today uh, is to give you a quick overview of everything you can do with these two uh, types of technologies, okay? So first, the machine learning APIs. So if you remember my own definition of machine learning, it's solving solutions from data. And data here can be text, pictures, videos, or speech. Then you need uh, models. And from that, you can extract information. And sometimes the result you want is your input transform, transcribe into something else, right? Okay. Now, let me start with the vision model. So I really uh, love this kind of model because uh, in the 90s, I was a student, uh, so we were not talking about machine learning at the time, but I was trying with other students to solve the problem of understanding what, what's in a picture, understanding the content of a picture to automatically detect stuff. And at the time, we were just trying to detect edges and it just failed miserably because we could do it on a few pictures and then as soon as we would bring something new, then it would fail, it would uh, not work anymore. Machine learning is the solution now. Uh, provide a picture to uh, a machine learning model, a vision model. Uh, first of all, uh, it's, supposed, it's able to give you labels to describe you the picture, what's in the picture in general. So here, this is a picture uh, um, about Obiton. So Obiton is uh, the place in New Zealand where the Lord of the Rings, the Lord of the Rings movies were shot. And this picture, so this is on the right, the JSON stream that I get from the API. And it tells me that at 95% of confidence, it's about nature and so on. So that's correct. More precisely, so if I take the same picture, but this time I zoomed in a little bit, I flipped it and cropped it, then a vision model is also able to match this picture with an existing one a public one on the web, and here it's able to tell me that most likely this, this feature is about this place. And I, I even get the GPS location for it, right? More precisely, here it must be a picture of the cast uh, in a restaurant, so still in New Zealand. It can try to detect entities, so it's called object detection. Uh, so detect entities, but precisely with a bounding box in pictures. And here the, the results I, I, I get are, that there are many persons, see, so this one is a person, right? But there are pants here uh, and even tops, okay? Here top. So it can be very precise. Even more precise, uh, it can detect faces in general, faces. So it's here it's a 3D rendition, and what I get is the, the crop box for the face, a large one or close one, but I get also, also the location of the different features. Uh, like the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and so on. I get the position of the head in three dimensions. And also, a vision model can be taught to detect emotions. So here, there are a, a few uh, generic emotions, and what it detects is that likely this face is angry, and this is Gollum. Uh, Gollum is always angry, right? Let's move on. So now, um, still on vision, Optical character uh, recognition, so OCR. This is a problem that is now fully solved thanks to machine learning. If I take this screenshot, the vision model is able to tell me that there are three main blocks, and then inside them there are sentences, or lines, or rows if you prefer, and then words, and then symbols. Um, it here doesn't make any mistakes, it's really perfect. Uh, so it's a solved problem. Even if I 
apply some perspective effect. So if you take a picture on a table or on a wall and so on, uh, it still works uh, really greatly. So let's say it's a solved problem. But the next step now for OCR is actually handwriting detection. And it starts to work really great already. So it's the same principle. So here, this is a handwriting from uh, Tolkien. And so it's not perfect. It's not as good as for typewriting. But here is detecting the Lord of the Rings. So ideally, it would uh, detect the first one here and the second one here. But then it works pretty well. And it's just making one big mistake here, shadows. So it's detecting a V instead of the Ws, something that could be uh, maybe autocorrected uh, with, uh, with uh, natural language processing. Uh, but it does very, it, it does very little mistakes here. There's a, the bottom of the F is detected uh, as something else. Uh, so it's almost perfect. It's really, really good. Uh, the limit of that, of course, is if we are not able ourselves to read back something that is unwritten, then a machine learning model won't be either. Uh, and, and the limit might be uh, doctor prescript prescriptions, right? Uh, Sometimes they are not even able themselves to read them back. Okay, so and and also um, it's able to detect entities and to match them up with uh, something uh, close to it uh, on the, uh, found on the web. So on this example, I took a picture from a Spanish newspaper that I, I had never seen before. So it's a very rare picture of Tolkien. Once again, I zoomed in, I cropped the picture, changed the colors, so there's not any single uh, pixel in common with the, the original one. But yet the visual model is able to detect this picture to, to tell me that it's coming from this Spanish newspaper. But more than that, it's able to match with the text on this web page and tell me that most likely this picture is about Tolkien. And what I get here, so GRR Tolkien, I get an entity ID. So this ID lets me work with a single ID and I will uh, deal with Tolkien this way uh, wherever uh, I'm working with these APIs, okay? How can it be used? So just a few lines. Uh, so this is a, a Python client library uh, that is available uh, as open source on GitHub and it's a wrapper around the API. So what you have to do is just always create a client, provide a content, so an image here. Oh, so I have two pictures, call the feature you're interested in, so face detection, for instance, and then you have the results right away, and you can deal with the results. Okay. So we've seen what you can do with pictures as of today. You can extrapolate uh, to imagine what you can do with videos, because videos are pictures with a time dimension, right? Um, so maybe the easiest is to show you uh, an example. If you can understand what is in a video, then it means you can index it. And so this video has, be, has gone through the video intelligence uh, model and I get labels and it tells me uh, what, what's in the video and where. So here at the beginning, I have a spiral galaxy. The world is made with... A bit later, I have humans. You learn to go, and in so doing... Here, I have a polar bear. So you see... You will fix them. ...the results, and then uh, you can really understand uh, what, what you have uh, in your data, in your input data. So let's move on. Uh, just uh, one code sample. So if you're interested to, to check out how it's done, I have written a, 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 um, a tutorial. So it's a code lab here. And actually to generate this or to get this information that there is an insect here on the video in, in a larger video, once again, it's always the same principle. You create a client, you indicate that you're interested in object tracking and you call annotate video. And then you get the results. If your video is a couple of, uh, if your video's duration is a couple minutes, then after one minute about, you will have the results. So it's, of course, not real time because it's a, 
a long processing. It's a harder processing to, to read all the frames from the video and understand what's in it. But you can actually track objects. So it's even better than on pictures. You can follow the, the objects in your videos. OK. So next, uh, text, text. So it's a very big field in computer science. It's called NLP, Natural Language Processing. Uh, I guess we all learned that if we uh, went to a computer uh, school. Uh, it's a really big field and latest advancement, advancements uh, came from machine learning again. So you provide text and the natural language uh, model is able to analyze the text and give you results. So on this sentence, it will tell me uh, first that it's in English, okay. It's able to give me the precise syntax of the sentence with all the different relationships. Uh, punctuation is detected, lemmas, I know that was uh, relates to the verb to be and so on. Uh, like in pictures, it's able to detect entities. And here I have three different classes, three different types of entities. In red, I have persons, Tolkien is a person, and by the way, if you notice here, I have an ID and it's exactly the same ID than that for the picture before. So I can really deal with Tolkien here on text and on pictures or videos. Um, and, and also one cool thing, uh, the natural language uh, model understands the context. So here, if Tolkien was actually not GR Tolkien, but Christopher Tolkien, the son, uh, then I will get Tolkien, Christopher Tolkien, uh, with a different ID, of course, the unique ID uh, for the son. Then British here uh, relates to the unique and the three books here, 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 are each detected as work, uh, works of art, uh, which is perfectly correct. Okay, you can also ask uh, to, for classification, okay, I have a, a, a book, I have a, a chapter, I have a paragraph, I have a sentence, you can ask um, uh, for, for content classification. And in this case, it tells me that this sentence should be classified under books and literature with a confidence of 97%, which is perfect. And finally, like in pictures, you can try to get a sentiment analysis, try to understand whether we're talking positively or negatively uh, in the text you provide. So to try that out, uh, what I did is I, I retrieved um, two, um, two articles, two reviews uh, about The Hobbit, one from the New York Times, uh, last centuries, last, the, the last century, and one from Goodreads, it's a social boot network. The first one is very positive, the second one as you can tell, is very negative. And the results are, I, I, I get are, for instance, for each sentence, I get a score between minus one and plus one, and it does work. These sentences come from the New York Times. This one too, it's a neutral one. Most of the sentences, of course, are neutral. Uh, the, these sentences come from Pauline's review who really hated the book. So some companies, for instance, are using that to understand how people, our users, are talking about their products uh, on Twitter or on the web and so on. Uh, so they are actually parsing, retrieving content and uh, using the natural language sen uh, sentiment analysis for that. Uh, sorry, uh, some companies are using that on emails, uh, on all the emails they receive to understand how happy or unhappy their customers are, it can be uh, pretty useful. Again, uh, to use that uh, in Python, uh, you create a client, you provide the content, a document, can be text or HTML, uh, and uh, you call analyze sentiment, and then you have the result uh, very, very quickly. Okay. In the same vein, uh, translation. So I won't get into details, I can share something with you. So uh, in 2016, I was still uh, working uh, on eBooks, and I was using Google Translate uh, and um, someday something happened. Uh, the results were uh, a lot better. And what uh, happened actually, uh, I got the answer since then, is that um, is, historically Google Translate was using uh, a machine learning, a phrase-based uh, uh, sorry, model. Uh, so mostly uh, statistical, a, a statistical model. And in 2016, Google Translate switched to 
a pure machine learning model. And this is why at the time, and since then it just kept improving, we suddenly got, got a big bump uh, in quality. Okay, uh, so here I just need two lines to use, to use it. I create a client, I call translate, and I have a translation right away. It works from and to uh, over 100 languages. So that's thousands uh, of different combinations. And finally, uh, regarding uh, machine learning APIs, speech, speech. So speech as an input, you talk and you get, you get uh, your speech transcribed into text. So this is also a problem that is now solved thanks to machine learning. If you're able to understand the speech that is in your data, then it means you can index it. So for instance, if I have a new audio file, then I can get the position of every word uh, in all my sentences. And to use it also uh, very easy, you create a client, you call recognize, uh, sorry, yeah, you call recognize and, and then you have the text uh, coming from your audio. So this is again uh, another tutorial I've written. Uh, you will find all, all the slides, uh, they are public, um, so you will get the link at the end. It's also on my, on my profile on EuroPython if you wanna try that. So what I tried in, in this one, I recorded myself uh, speaking uh, French poetry aloud, a very famous one from La Fontaine, and just asked for, uh, so I'm helping here a little bit, telling that I know beforehand that it's French. Uh, asking for automatic punctuation. So this is a new feature that is very, very important. Uh, it will give you the caps, it will give you commas and so on. Uh, and here I'm also asking for the word time offsets so, so that I can index uh, my, uh, my different words, okay. Now the opposite, text to speech. You provide text and then you get a speech out of that. Uh, 20 years ago, I used a text-to-speech engine in, in the, the first European ebook reader we made. It was a big failure. So I, 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 I did work uh, quite a few uh, weeks on, on it. I was very proud of the result, but the, the result at the time was that you pressed uh, the play a button to get the book to be read aloud. And the result you got was Alice in Wonderland and so on, I am a robot talking to you. So now this is finished. This is also a, a, a solved problem thanks to machine learning. Uh, at Google, this is coming from a technology called WaveNet. It's, uh, it's been developed by DeepMind. Maybe you know DeepMind because they, they've beaten uh, the, the Go uh, world champion. Uh, more recently, they are beating uh, gamers, young people um, who are champions at StarCraft. So DeepMind is trying to solve problem um, by starting from scratch and building from scratch a machine learning model. Um, and here, uh, it's really uh, amazing. Let, let, me, uh, let me get to you to hear uh, these examples. So one is the original recording and the other one uh, is actually the, the speech uh, synthesized uh, with the same uh, sentence. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. It is University. really hard to, to tell the difference. Uh, so if you want to know this one, uh, the one on, on the right uh, is the original recording. I try to listen to them uh, very loud and so on. Uh, it is a very, very natural um, uh, result. Uh, maybe it's the best model so far from everything I've, sh I've shown to you. I have to admit, uh, even though I love the vision model, uh, because it's solving a problem uh, I was trying to solve. This one uh, is honestly uh, really uh, uh, amazing because it's hard to tell the difference. This is, WaveNet is, uh, are the voices you can hear in uh, Google Homes, uh, in Google Assistants. Uh, and let's, uh, by the way, try something uh, all together, okay? So I don't know if you noticed, but on, um, on Google search, you can actually do a search with your voice. So let's try that out. What is the temperature in Paris? It's 27 so, degrees in Paris noticed, right now. It's giving you results in real time. Um, 
even though it, it might be wrong at some time when I started to pronounce temperature, uh, I'm on purpose, I use my French accent and it's been able to understand me. So let's try something else. Now I'm going to go to, to the French version. Okay. Quelle est la température à Londres? Oh, sorry. Let me try again. I didn't. Here's a matching video. Quelle est la, temp Quelle est la température à Londres? Oh, I know. I forgot. I, I, I told you. I know what I did wrong. I told you I'm going to go on the French website, but I'm actually still on the English one. So here. Now I switch to the French one. Sorry about that. Voici quelques informations à propos de la French. Marseille, 1975, Pierre Michel, jeune magistrat venu de Metz avec femme et enfant, est nommé juge du grand banditisme. Selon Futura Science, chez l'humain, une température interne de 37 degrés Celsius est communément admise. Il fait actuellement 23 degrés à Londres. Je veux vous montrer l'opposé. Donc, je vais vous demander un French, un Christian en French, mais avec un accent anglais. Et donc, j'ai mis un peu parce que j'ai commencé à parler à la mauvaise heure. Mais ce que vous pouvez voir, c'est que vous obtenez des résultats en temps réel et vous obtenez les résultats expectés. Il est capable de me comprendre. Uh, even though I'm, I'm really <laughs> uh, making it hard to, to, to be understood. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that um, the, the, the speech to text engine has understood, has been trained and has understood how to uh, make, um, uh, has understood the essence of our language and, our, and has understood the characteristics, the specifics of a speech to be able to understand the different words. Okay. So we've seen everything you can do uh, uh, with existing models, or there are, of course, uh, more features, uh, many options. Uh, it would take a, a day to cover them all. Uh, if you want to generate text, again, I've made uh, this tutorial uh, to generate. So it does take this to generate these three sentences in three different languages. What you need to do is to create a, a client again. You need to call synthesize speech and you need to provide some uh, parameters like the language, uh, you, you, you want to generate that. Uh, the name of the voice, so there are different uh, WaveNet voices if you want a human-like human, uh, human -like sounding voice and you have different uh, options. So here I, with only this, I can generate three uh, Wave files. Uh, you, can, you can try that in this tutorial, okay? So next, a big gap. Uh, that is filling many, many needs, auto email techniques. So let me uh, show you this example, uh, you will understand better. If I take these two pictures, which are different, right? And give them to the vision model, it will give me almost the same results. Sky cloud, sky cloud. Because those pictures are, are actually clouds in the sky. But if I want to build um, a forecasting uh, service, for instance, to, I, I need to be able to understand the shape of the clouds. I need to know that it's a cyrus here and an alto cumulus here. And then I'm stuck because the only info I have is that it's a cloud, uh, it's a cloud in the sky. So auto email here uh, can help you still without uh, any expertise in machine learning. So the difference, compared to the API, the API is that you need to work a little bit more. You need to build, you need to provide your own data set. You need to provide training data. You need to look for examples and, and give that uh, to uh, the AutoML pipeline. Once you have the data set, you can launch a training. Uh, it's fully auto automated. And generally, you will need a couple of iterations to understand how well your data set is doing. And then once you're happy, uh, you can deploy and serve. And then you come back to the previous case where you have your own, this time your own private API that you can use in all of your solutions. So it's still work 
online here. If you want something that can work offline, then you can try, uh, you can train a model that we call uh, an edge model because you will be able to deploy it on the edge somewhere else. So it's a smaller model, uh, not as efficient as the cloud model, but maybe it will, uh, it, it can it can work um, and, and fulfill your needs. So once you have trained your edge model, you can export it and you can get it to run in a container. You can get it to run on your smartphone or even in a web browser with uh, TensorFlow.js. Okay, uh, so it's very uh, useful, for instance, because uh, in uh, factories on production lines, for many reasons, uh, very often you don't have um, you don't have uh, internet connectivity, or you don't want to 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 have have it. So you need something that works offline. Um, even for web browser solutions, of course, you can down, you need to download the model first, but then you can work offline and have something that works in your browser tab um, with a local uh, model. Okay, so once um, you have built your data set, so here, if I want to make a difference, I need to label them. So I have a cumulus, cumulus, cumulus numbers and so on. So you label your pictures. Here it's a classification problem. You want to make the difference between different pictures. You don't need millions of pictures like uh, for the big uh, machine learning uh, models we've seen before. Here, you just need a couple of hundreds of pictures per label, ideally 1,000, but with just a couple of hundreds, it starts to work really great. And once you have done your data set, you can launch a training. So here, this is a one compute hour training. Here are three compute hour training. And then you get a sense of uh, how well it is doing because <clears throat> your data set, 80% of your data set is used for training. 10% to evaluate uh, the best architecture, and the final 10%, 10 uh, the final, the other 10% are used to ev evaluate how well uh, it is it is doing. Okay, uh, you uh, for classification, you can uh, use the confusion matrix to have an idea about how well it is doing. So here, for instance, it's doing great with cumulus numbers and cumuluses, uh, but doing really bad with the alto cumulus. Uh, almost 50% uh, of the time, it is uh, confusing it with something something else. So the reason uh, there are there are two reasons here is first we have less samples of alto cumuluses, and second um, they all look alike. So um, making data set is going to be an art. I think um, you really need to understand that you want to build a balanced data set, and you want to try to remove as much as possible the bias that could be in your data set. Because you're, go you're going to, to get predictions. You have 10 minutes left. To get results out of the model. And, and if, you, if you interpret the result as a causality, uh, actually, uh, it may not be causality. And, and uh, this is the, the, the issue that we can have with the bias. OK. Uh, so. Uh, it should, should could be something interesting uh, interesting for um, another talk. Once you have trained your model, then you can use it in an API. You can provide it uh, with new pictures it has never seen before. So here, this is my own private picture. Uh, I was in Poland that day, and it's telling me that there's a, uh, a cumulus in this picture at 97th uh, percent. Um, really great. Okay. So if you remember my definition, um, we need, we have data and we want uh, information. So auto ML techniques as of today work already on text, pictures, videos, and also structured data. And this time you need to choose um, the features that you want to, um, to, to detect. So for instance, uh, you want to do custom classification, maybe you want to detect custom objects in your pictures. Uh, on videos, as of today, you can do custom classification. Uh, there are beta features also for custom object tracking and so on. You can build your own models uh, on text uh, with custom natural language uh, features. You can do your own custom translation and you can do custom uh, predictions on the... So it's a 
new field, uh, I, I would say uh, since two years now, uh, it's just the beginning, but it's going, going to be very useful because you don't need any expertise to build a model. So I've done a demo uh, that we are going to be able to try all live. If you are on YouTube, there is a delay. So maybe when you hear that, uh, it will be too late. And, and uh, I, don't, I don't know how much the, the delay is on, on YouTube live. So uh, what I've done is a small demo where you're going to be able to upload selfies. And um, in the first part, uh, I'm going to, to call the vision API and try to detect generic emotions. But I also, I'd like to know, I don't see you. I don't, I'd like to know if someone is sleeping, someone is yawning, or someone is having fun. So I've built with my teammates and with uh, attendees from previous conferences, I've been my own private custom model that is able to, I hope, able to detect automatically uh, these uh, situations. Okay, the way it works is the following. So from your smartphone, you're going to be able to upload a selfie. It will automatically trigger a Python function, which will call the Vision API and maybe the AutoML Vision uh, My Own API if needed. And then we'll do something here, thanks to the analysis, we'll store the result here, and you will see it on your smartphone. Here, this is a serverless uh, small application. It's actually my administration backend for the demo. And here on the screen, you will see the result uh, from the administration panel, okay? So let's try that out. So I invite you to open uh, the, the camera on your smartphone. Okay, it's starting, sorry for the delay. Okay, so you can uh, either flash the QR code here or you can enter uh, in your browser this URL, bit.ly slash smartep20, bit.ly slash smartep for your Python 20, smartep20. Okay, so let, if, you, if you go there, you will reach this page and I'm going to we still have about five minutes. I'm going to go to step one, okay? bit.ly slash smartep20. So it will ask you for authorization to use uh, your webcam. So here, this is uh, the generic vision model that is going to be used. You can try to uh, upload a selfie and try to trigger a detection for one of these emotions. Uh, so let's try that. Yeah, um, my, my network must be a bit slow, I'm sorry. Seems to be okay. But it's in the cloud, so maybe uh, you'll get faster results on, on your side. I have no feedback, so I don't know if it's working for you. <laughs> Oops, uh, I should have gotten the results already. Uh, maybe I forgot to pray the demo gods before. Maybe that's why. Okay, so let me try again. Sorry about it. I hope it works on, on your side. Okay, so I had an issue before. Uh, yeah, so it does detect surprise with a high level of confidence. Let's try another one. And, and maybe you've, you've seen, I, as I have the position of the nose, the mouse, uh, the eyes, everything, I could, I can actually add a mustache to everyone. Uh, so let's try this last one. Okay, joy with high confidence. Okay, um, let's now switch. You can try a few times if you want. Let's switch to the auto email part. So here, if you refresh the page or if you click next, you should be on the same one, but with my own private model. And this time try to uh, 
to trigger, uh, try to stick out your tongue to yawn or to sleep, okay? Okay, it found that I'm yawning. Let's try another one. Uh, this time the, to make the difference between the generic API and my AutoML API, uh, the mustache uh, will have the French uh, flag colors. Let's try it. Yeah, it does work. So uh, you, could, you could tell that I'm cheating and I'm actually cheating because I build this model with pictures of me, pictures of my teammate and uh, uh, of other previous attendees. So of course, uh, it's normal that it works, but we are going to check whether it works for you too. Wow, 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 many people. So Marc-André, uh, Okay, so happy people. So that was with the generic API. Still surprised people, so that's me. Uh, here, here maybe it was a surprise we wanted to trigger. Uh, it's in between surprise and sadness. Uh, here it's between surprise and joy. Here are two sad people, yeah. Here hungry. Yeah, 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 you're really angry. <laughs> and my auto email model. So let's try if I have, yeah, yeah. So more, more pictures are coming. You all have your tongue out. Great. Tired people. Oops, sorry. Tired people. Yes. So you see it's, I did input people uh, yawning with or without their, uh, their hand. It works and people sleeping. Yeah, it works too. And finally, if you remember, it's able to detect objects with a pre precise location. So here I have the people, all the attendees with glasses, and it seems to work great. Okay. So a couple of minutes. So you see it's really easy to use, to do. Um, one note, there are two ways to measure um, uh, how well your model is performing. And for that, you have to understand the notion of true and false positives, of positives and negatives, and whether they are true or false. Uh, there are four different cases. Uh, if you're focusing on quality, then the precision is the metric you're interested in. If you are using a search engine, then you will uh, use the recall metric. And here you, you want to minimize the number of false negatives. You want more results. Uh, I will let you have a look at this um, if you want to a little bit understand how a toy mail works. Uh, at least at Google, there's one uh, specific feature. Uh, if you want to do more machine learning, then you can use frameworks. One of them is TensorFlow. So it's an open source, uh, uh, maybe the most, uh, the most popular one on, on GitHub. By far, another one is PyTorch uh, that I hear a lot from, uh, from experts. So what have we seen? Uh, we've seen that there are three ways you can use that. Uh, with the APIs, you just need a couple of hours. With AutoML, you need days and weeks or months if you want to become an expert. The difficulty, there's absolutely no difficulty uh, with the APIs. Uh, with AutoML, you need to build the data set and for that you need a couple of days, okay? A few links if you're interested to uh, check out uh, some solutions. Here, this is uh, uh, an online comic coming from Google AI. Uh, you will find uh, lots of the terms, so it's a, a nice refresh if you want to understand a bit better. If you want to get uh, the slides for this talk, they are here. Uh, you're very much welcome uh, to send me uh, feedback too. So thanks a lot for, for uh, having me today. Uh, my goal is, was to give you this overview of what you can do as a developer and uh, and you don't have to be an expert uh, to, to do everything uh, you, you've seen. Um, so uh, I hope you learn a few things uh, and also uh, even better, I hope uh, it gave you a few ideas. Uh, thanks a lot for having me today and have fun. Have a great year Python. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Laurent. That was a very interesting talk. Lots of topics, lots of uh, things covered. We do have a number of questions. Um, but the time is already up, so I would say that we basically take them to the uh, to the ta talk channel that I posted uh, in the chat. 
and then you can answer them there. Uh, it would also be a good idea to maybe post the links that you have here in the slides in the talk channel so that they stay sure. up and then are easily reachable. Sure, I will do so immediately. Right, so let me give you your applause. Well deserved.